I read often, oh, that, that stress is making you fat, right? I still don't understand this conversation okay. about stress. I understand stress on the brain. I, do you look at my stomach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, I can see there's a problem. <laughs> well, with my, um, hedge, with my hedge fund clients, yeah. who I would see monthly or less if they were in New York, they would just lift their T-shirt up when I walked into the room to, to, and say, like, now you know how the last month's trading's been. Honestly? Yeah. Why on earth is what's going on stress-wise affecting the amount of fat we're carrying then? The way that we were wired from cave times is that if we were chronically stressed, so... Basically, our adrenal glands, which are back here above our kidneys, they release this hormone called cortisol, and that correlates 100% with stress. So if you're releasing a lot of cortisol, you will be feeling things like fear or anger or, you know, sadness. Um, if you are feeling stressed mentally, your adrenal glands will produce the appropriate amount of cortisol to match that. So normally, in the 24-hour cycle, we release some melatonin to go to sleep when it gets dark, and that's, you know... We're not li really living with the light-dark cycle as naturally as, you know, we used yeah. to. And then around dusk, we'll release the largest spike of cortisol for the 24-hour period, which is to help us wake up. And then depending on your age and your gender, there's a normal range between which it can fluctuate during the day. And so if something stressful happens, it might, you know, go towards the top of that level. And then as soon as you've resolved the issue, it'll go back down to a lower level. But the way we're living now, which we've already discussed, means that our cortisol levels are either constantly at the top of that normal range or even have tipped over and are higher than that normal range. And so there are receptors in the brain because the blood flows you know, around your body and your brain, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And these receptors monitor the levels of cortisol. And if they see that it's high all the time or higher than it should be, then the brain starts to say, what are the reasons that I could, you know, that there's a threat to my survival? And funnily enough, the first thing that still comes up, even though it's not true for most people, thankfully, in the world, is starvation. Mm. In the cave, that was the biggest threat to our survival. So to help us to survive until we could, you know, hunt down a woolly mammoth or pick enough nuts and berries to, to you know, feed the tribe, the cortisol drives fat... Um, being held in your abdominal fat cells. Right. So we have subcutaneous fat, which is all around our body equally distributed, and then we have visceral fat, which is around our abdominal organs, and a level of which protects our organs. But then if cortisol is driving fat being deposited there, that's when you see the pot bellies. You know, the kind of uneven distribution of fat right. and the people reporting, I need to loosen my belt, even though I'm being more active and I'm eating less. Those things that normally work don't work if cortisol is opposing that action. So high levels of stress are genuinely negatively affecting brain and body. Yeah, so, so in the brain, when it feels that it's under-resourced, it's not going to give up resources for things like being creative, being flexible, regulating our emotions. It's going to go into what I call low power mode. So your blood supply gets brought down to the most basic survival functions that you need, which in the modern day is show up at work and look like you're, you're doing enough that you don't get fired. And then what's also happening is those high levels of cortisol that are flowing around your blood start to become corrosive to your immune system. So it can start with things like you get more colds and flus or you get a cold or a flu that lasts for weeks and weeks. And then at the other end of the spectrum, it can mean that you're unable to fight off um, heart disease and cancers. What about if we're addicted to it, the stress, the constant having things that we're doing, the, we love that feeling? You know, Huel has been a staple of my diet for some time, and I'm currently loving these Huel Daily A to Z vitamins. Tastes great, refreshing. Each can has 26 vitamins and minerals, offering 154 science-backed health benefits, reduced tiredness and fatigue, normal cognitive function, healthy skin, hair and nails, and vitamin D for immunity. This is a vitamin drink that offers everything you could need it to. So what are you waiting for? Grab it right now in Tesco stores nationwide or at huel.com and let me know what you think. We're addicted to the things perhaps that we're doing that are causing us stress, but we wouldn't be addicted to the stress because 
when you have cortisol in your body, it doesn't feel good. Right. You feel agitated, you feel angry, you feel um, afraid. Your brain dredges up all these negative memories to kind of try and keep you safe. So it's not, it's not a good feeling. Um, but it might be that the things that you're trying to achieve, like working really hard, training really hard, traveling a lot, you know, socializing too much, that those things, I put them on a spectrum from motivation to addiction. Because there's a lot of things that are good for you, like having a good job, having friends, some travel, you know, gentle exercise. But it's when it tips over into all being cortisol inducing, that's what mental resilience is, the fact that you can bring yourself back from that. When you can't, that then that's a problem and it can lead to burnout, basically. Right. This reminds me of when when I came to London, I left left the countryside, got a job on kids' telly. And I don't know whether you see this a lot, but the most exciting part of my life was the most stressful part of my life. Mm. And I think we've found that actually with a lot of guests who've mm-hmm. joined us on this show. And I really had a bit of a, a mental health breakdown. And I went back to back home, went to the GP, and he said, explain what's going on. And his answer was, maybe you're not cut out for working in London in the media. You should come back to the countryside and get a, a re- an easier job. Obviously, I ignored that. But I imagine that's a message given to, to many people who feel like that, that someone says, well, maybe this, maybe that life is not for you, but it's the life that we love. So mm. for people who are in this place right now where mm-hmm. life brings all of these challenges, mm-hmm. how can they build that mental resilience? How can they get to that place where it's exciting, it's busy, it's full on, but it's also healthy? Mm-hmm. So the best way to do that is... I'll tell you what the things and the how. Great. So the things are anything that connects your mind and your body. So, uh, you know, things we know as mindfulness techniques. So that includes um, writing in a journal to offload, offload your emotions, making gratitude lists to, you know, push your brain from that fear state to the more loving, trusting state where you have the bonding hormone oxytocin that's mm. good for you. Um, yoga, meditation, gentle exercise, time in nature and you know, other things that we can go into details of. But the thing with those is that if you're not really doing any of those and you say, okay, I'm going to start journaling every day and going for a you know, one-hour walk in nature three times a week, it's it probably going to be difficult to fit that into your lifestyle. So I like to create 12 micro habits for a year. And this was a game changer for me, right. going from New Year's resolutions to 12 micro habits, because I would pick three or four for the first quarter and try to embed them into my life. And then, you know, maybe two or three of those would become habits quite easily. So then I picked the next three or four. And by doing that, by the end of the year, I would have at least eight or 10 habits that were just things I didn't even think about anymore. You know, I I don't always get all 12. Um, And what are they currently? Can you share some of them that you've started this year with? Yeah, so um, an hour in nature, but I think I've set that one for like three days a week. Yeah. Um, A one hour walk every day. Um, trying to think of a variety of things. Eating more protein and less carbohydrate. Eating till I'm a hun- at, <laughs> eating till I'm eighty percent full. Right. Yeah. Um, and gratitude, journaling, tapping, mantras, chanting. The, you know, trying to bring a bit more of the ancient wisdom in this year um, because I've been researching that in the last year. So yeah, things like that. 